these elements in the diagonal, uh, these are going to be normal stresses, always. And the elements outside the diagonal So, diagonal elements are normals of diagonal are going to be shear stresses. We're going to see which shear is uh, in each location uh, just in a little bit. But, but before we do that, uh, just to make this example uh, add some numbers to it. I think by now you can tell me what is the vertical stress in this location. Just a rough estimation. So what would you say to be the vertical stress? Let's do it in units of PSI. Don't forget the units. Units are very important. It's a place onshore. The depth is 10,000 feet. Therefore, the vertical strength should be more or less. How much? Do you remember the gradient of vertical stress was one PSI per foot? So in this particular case, the vertical stress is 10,000 PSI, uh, rough estimation. Uh, let's say that I have this condition in which the maximum vertical stress is vertical and the minimum principal stress is uh, horizontal. What do you think would be a typical value of horizontal stress? You, you don't know this so far. I didn't tell you anything, okay? But, but that's in the direction in which we're going. Uh, but, but let's just play a little bit before we get to that value. Could it be zero? No, it, 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 can, be, it can be zero. Uh, when you add weight on the rock, the rock always tends to expand to the side. Uh, and as it tries to expand, if you got more rock around it, that's going to build up stress. So it's not going to be zero. Could it be uh, higher than the vertical stress in this case? No, right? Because we know that I have assumed that in this particular case uh, that that's not the case. So a typical value for this minimum principal stress under hydrostatic condition is going to be more or less but this, this is just an estimation okay 60 to 70 percent of the value of SD yes did you do the inequalities uh, sorry did you know, like what the inequalities it should be less than. Should be less than. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, these symbols, they don't make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, should be the t -shirt. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, so in a normal faulting setting uh, with hydrostatic core pressure, we're going to see, we're going to develop all the equation that tells us that this can be from 60 to 70 percent. And this is what you know also as a frag gradient or the fraction pressure. Because that's the minimum absolute pressure that you need in order to uh, create a hydraulic fracture. So let's say for this example, this is uh, 6,500. And let's say that I'm just making up this number. This one is 7,000. But now we have completed the stress uh, tensor for uh, this particular place, uh, place. Let me.
write that on top of it. So you remember that I told you that the vertical stress, for example, at this location, was the pressure needed to lift the ground, literally lift the ground in that location up. Well, if you do a hydraulic fracture, the hydraulic fracture, instead of lifting the ground, is going to find the lowest stress possible to open up space. And in this case, the minimum pressure uh, in order to open a hydraulic fracture would be the minimum total stress, which in this case is SHE. All right, so in order to fully describe the state of the stress at, at a particular location, we're going to need these tensors. We need three values which are independent from each other, and also very important, let me write in color because it's important. We need three values, but also we need three directions, and they are all independent. And at the end, we're going to need six independent quantities. Three values and three directions. All right, so let's talk now about shear stresses and we're going to complete uh, this stress tensor and see uh, how it looks. Uh, and we're going to uh, have to make here uh, adopt the convention for that. Uh, we're going to be working in three dimensions. So I'm going to write, I'm going to draw my axis of three dimensions. We're going to use a right handed coordinate system. Uh, and that means that you use your right, right hand, and the first element is your index, second is middle finger, and third is your thumb. So if I chose that particular one, uh, and let's say I want this one to be one. So if this is one, this is two, and this one has to be three. Uh, notice that three, you can have one and two go in this direction, but three has to go in that direction. You cannot go down. Because otherwise it's not going to be right-handed coordinate system. And your convention, and all the things that we're going to develop are not going to work. So make sure that always you deal with the right-handed coordinate system. <laughs> this one, index one, middle is two, thumb is three. So for this example, this one is going to be one, this one is going to be two, and this is going to be the axis number, number uh, three. And it's the same, for example, if you call it uh, X, Y, Z, or if you wanted to call it uh, I, I, J, K, uh, it, it, it's the same, okay? Uh, but in this case, just call it one, two, three. So one index, two, middle finger, three thumb. Okay, so. Now, with this coordinate system, what we're going to do is we're going to place a prismatic element and in this prismatic element we'll draw all the components of stress. Okay, um, so for this particular coordinate system, we said that we're going to have nine elements. We already saw what was S11, S22, and S33. We said those are normal stresses. And if you want to write them here, let me change this to color, so it's easier to look at. Uh, S11, S22, S33. Okay. So, this is the convention. The first element 
here tells you in which phase the stress is applied. And the second element tells you in which direction the stress goes. So when I say which phase is applied, uh, here this cube is going to have uh, six phases. And the ones that we can look at uh, on this uh, side of the cube is going to be uh, this phase, I'm going to call it one positive. I'm going to tell you why the positive, okay? Uh, but uh, before I do that, this is the phase perpendicular to the axis one, so I'm going to call it phase one. This phase over here is the phase perpendicular to the axis two, and this phase over here is the phase perpendicular to the axis three. So S11 is going to be the stress applied on phase number one on direction one. What is this one going to be called? It's going to be S22, and uh, this one over here is going to be called S33. Okay, notice the direction of the arrows. The direction of the arrow in this case, it means that they are pushing against the cube, and for this in order to be in equilibrium, although I'm not drawing it, on the hidden side of the cube, there should be another stress which is equal to this one. So it's in equilibrium. The same for S11, the same for S33. So if you put two stresses like this, this is going to compress, and this is going to be under compression. <coughs> in geomechanics, we're going to say that uh, stresses that are positive mean compression. And stresses which are negative are tension. All right, so the convention here is that you would always write this as a positive number, what goes in here, if it is a compression. And usually the convention is that you will draw the direction of the arrow on the positive phase. This is a positive, positive phase, positive phase in the direction opposite to the axis in which it is oriented. Let, let me say that again. I'll go with an example. Let's do it with number three. A positive phase means that I have moved in positive direction in direction three. So you see, if I start here and I go positive and I get to there, I get to the positive phase. So that's why this, this one is called the positive phase. In direction three, this one over here will be the negative. And in that positive phase, I have to always draw the stresses in a direction which are opposite to the direction of the base. And that's gonna be a positive now. For the case of the normal stresses, it's uh, a little bit uh, easier. But for the shear stresses, it's a bit more complex. So uh, this is that shear stresses are going to be in the off-diagonal terms. And this is going to be S23, S32. And they're going to be drawn with the same convention of the other stress. Just one more minute, guys. Um, let's do these two examples. S12 and S13, in which phase are going to be applied? One. On phase number one, and this S12, in which direction it goes? Two. In direction two, and in the positive phase, it's going to be in direction opposite to the axis. So this is going to be S12. And S13 is going to be this one. So, in the stress tensor, we're going to have all the stresses possible. And now these are not 
equal to zero, and uh, we're going to have the shear stresses and the normal stresses. And we're going to see in the next class that out of those nine independent values, uh, or out of those nine values, just six are independent. So if we know those six values, we can fully characterize the state of stress, which is similar to what we had before, three principal stresses and three directions. All right, guys, I'll see you on Friday.